Hello, I'm Lorenzo and this is episode 22 of KSP to Mars. In the previous episode we unlocked nuclear technology and today we're playing around with that. So with this updated high technology comes string and safety regulations, lots of paperwork, stacks and stacks of helmets to keep everyone safe and hopefully a glorious and prosperous new age for the Kerbal people. The rocket you're watching right this moment carries a small nuclear reactor and some antennae, payload and command and control software which will take it into orbit and study the dynamics of nuclear power in space. Now of course none of this has any gameplay benefit, I'm just launching a nuke to see uh, what I can do with that. And of course to have a nuclear satellite in space, at least that's the point. Another new technology we're using is the Skipper liquid engine. They are powering this rather compact rocket. The Kerbal engineer tells me it does have enough delta V to reach orbit. That is, of course, if all the stages remain attached. So let's give that another go. Redid the staging bar and launching this rocket. Something appears to be up and the rocket is horribly wobbling. And that didn't go too well either. That's two nuclear reactors that have now been scattered over the KSC grounds. Let's give that another go. Fortunately, the Kerbals are already green, so any radioactive fallout will only turn them greener or possibly more radiant. This is something that they don't mind at all. I'd have it on good authority. Well, this happens again. It's not looking very pretty. I don't know why this wobble is shaking apart the craft. I think there might be a part clipping into some other part, or it's just good old rocket instability. Try number four for those of you keeping score. And fortunately... Nuclear reactors have been mass-produced immediately after the technology was unlocked, so we have enough of them. This rocket here, now when... Th this looks fairly okay. This is again a post-commentary, so it's a little bit hard to remember what exactly happened. But the boosters are burning out, and... Oh yeah, everything is going fine. I thought it cut forward, I made that a few days ago. And something would have been horribly wrong, but everything so far appears to be going fine. What is not going fine though is the trajectory. We're going very sideways and we're not very high up yet, so maybe that's the big failure. Anyway, this rocket is... Oh, look at that. The trajectory wasn't great, but there are bigger problems. Uh, the capsule is still being boosted upwards, but this is a configuration that's not very stable. And... There they go. The plan for today is to get a nuclear reactor to fly and do things. And that mission can still be accomplished with this probe. We're at 55 kilometers altitude, still rising. And we have here a probe core with one of the KSP interstellar nuclear reactors and a fuel tank. And that is making an engine while well, it has a nozzle as well, but that's it. The funny bit of KSP interstellar is that you actually have to make these rockets, you put a nuclear reactor and a nozzle, and that could also be a generator or something else that needs power. Of course, the nuclear thermal rocket is a nuclear reactor that takes fuel, superheats it, and then shoots it out the back. So most of the energy comes from the nuclear core and not, in fact, the combustion of the fuel. It doesn't even have to combust at all. Today it is combusting for that little bit of extra kick, sort of like an afterburner. We'll call this test successful, it's not quite orbital, but we did fly a nuclear reactor well, in the upper reaches of the atmosphere. So what we're doing now is the actual purpose of today is to fly a Kerbal to the moon, of course. This slightly revised launcher carries a Kerbal, let's see, I can't really see his name. The letters are too small now in post-production, that is a problem sometimes. I think it's Ger German, something like that. Anyway, you can see that better than I can at the moment. He is sitting on top a stock game NERVA engine. NERVA stands for Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle, of Nuclear Energy for Rocket Vehicle Application. I think that's what it means anyway. He's taking one of those engines up into space and onto the moon, and on top of his lander there is a small, tiny... Um, return pod so that he can get back again. Now this mission has not been calculated out. This craft has about 18 kilometers per second of delta V and courtesy of the Ferrum Aerospace Research the ascents are a little bit more efficient 
than they were in previous episodes so we might very well make it although none of that is assured because well the earth is big the moon is big and the distances are huge one thing you might have noticed with all these launches by the way is that there's no sound that's because for the recording of these episodes I was playing some music and I misplaced a check mark in a checkbox and that music ended up being recorded as well and now I can't play it because of copyright issues oh shit while I was going on about music that whole rocket destabilized so German German I think you're high, en high up enough so that you can decouple all the bits from the rocket and still survive it wouldn't wouldn't do to have the first nuclear powered casualty on the first nuclear powered manned mission to the moon that might very well scrub a space program in any nation that's not quite as insane as the Kerbal one see there's the glorious stock nuclear engine and that is a slightly more efficient one than the tier 1 KSP interstellar one so that's the one I'll be using for these first missions of course when we get more science and unlock the better KSP interstellar propulsion methods <laughs> oh dear <laughs> then we will use those right um, you might have guessed it but today's mission was not what you call a smashing success after landing safely he immediately went into the rocket again and this time he won't be so lucky I don't think he is breaking and he smacks into his nuclear reactor with the parachute deployed but it was too little too late and we have in fact our first nuclear engine casualty so here we go again launching that rocket now what we're running into or what I was running into uh, when I was launching all these rockets was basic design issues like forgetting a strut misplacing a launch clamp um, in the end uh, that all was fixed but it did cost me a lot of launches and a lot of kerbals. Now let's see if this one goes. I genuinely don't know um, which. Uh, eventually, eventually they do stop exploding on the pad or slightly above it. But I'm not sure if this is the one or if that's still to come. So let's have a look here. All the fuel tanks are draining equally. That means that none of the stacks have sheared off and are still pushing the whole rocket upwards. The solid boosters are halfway done now and as soon as they are done we can jettison them and the rocket will be a fair bit more controllable. One thing I was looking for in the parts uh, window in the vehicle assembly building was some aerodynamic nose cones for the big fuel tanks and I haven't found any yet. I can use the adapters and put the small nose cones on but the adapter weighs like 300 kilograms, like 0.3 of a ton so I decided not to use those and instead count on the fact that these rockets are for the most part under the fairing at the top so that should shield it a little bit I'm not sure if that's actually happening but I didn't put any aerodynamic aids on there so here go the solid boosters let's see if that goes well that does go well that separation has happened now on to the rest of the trajectory a good 230 meters per second angled slightly over and well we survive until this point at least we're now in the asparagus stage, staged upper stage coming up on the separation of the first two boosters this is a five column booster where they drop off two by two and then leave a center stack and this is not the one that's successful yet unfortunately Matt Bowkerman our astronaut of the day is in a position to get uh, to to get back to the planet safely. He has his capsule. He has his things. Oh, and upon firing his nuclear engine, he does lose it immediately. Not sure why that happened. But he is still okay. Still in his capsule. Still not dead. Ditching now the lunar landing legs and. Hey, we can do some science and he can recover 3.2 science points by this goo result from the upper atmosphere still not maxed out on that one the problem here is that while he's not going at orbital velocity he is going fast so there will be some re-entry difficulty and of course if he separates the pod then all the experiments are lost oh, sorry about that as we see here which rapidly hap what rapidly happens 
aerodynamic forces turn around his ship, slam his parachute into the atmosphere, and burn it up. So, unfortunately, Matt Bokerman will be the second casualty of the day in our nuclear-powered rocket program. Not a direct casualty of the nukes, but still dead. He decides to go it without the capsule, and we can all predict how that will turn out, I think. Let's have a look here. Trying to put him on his helmet so he can survive the drop, but he's still happy. I suppose the spacesuit is flavored or scented in, in whatever way he finds the most pleasing, but he's still plummeting towards the planet. Shortly followed hot on his heels by a hot nuclear reactor. So that's the theme of the day. Everything is going horribly, horribly wrong. Not this next one, though. This next one is definitely going to make it. Promise. Promise, promise, promise. At least that's what I told the, the Congress, the funding people. The rocket looks the same. We are launching up on solid boosters and we have... Well, I can't read the name again. We have Belgrad. German or something. Belmond, Belgard. A brave German straight from astronaut recruitment. Don't worry, those explosions are just the ditch stage. We don't need that anymore. And let's see if this separation is going to happen according to plan today. Yes, it does. Great, we're as far as we've ever been into our lunar mission. That's coming up on the separation of the second boosters. There they go. And now we are home free with the center stack separating and now we're going on nuclear power. Nuclear engine lighting and propelling us to the moon. Or not. Hang on, hang on one second. You, you're thinking now that you saw a rocket explode and a nuclear engine going haywire and shooting off anywhere but the moon. But in fact that it didn't happen. It didn't happen. What happened was this. We launched the engine, it burned fine, and it put us on a moon escape trajectory, well, a moon intercept trajectory and Kerbin escape trajectory. So that engine is performing flawlessly, and we are in fact headed for Luna. Now, this burn is very long, it's about 3 kilometers per second to get from Kerbin orbit to the moon. Uh, compare that to the stock game where that's about a thousand. So as is the case with most things, this is harder in the real solar system. We're coming up on the point where we ditch our side tanks. No point taking that along. And now you're thinking that you see a detached nuclear engine flying off into the black abyss. Not sure what's wrong with you today, but that definitely didn't happen. That did not happen. And the craft is intact and happily on its way to the moon. And here we are, coming up on moon landing number one with a kerbal in it as you can see from this craft we are carrying side tanks which have the landing legs and some science well the point was to land this lander on the surface do the science obviously and then detach the empty tanks and fly back home the problem is these empty these side tanks have run out of fuel a while ago turns out that the delta v calculation or more accurately, Delta V guess, did fall a little bit short of what we would need. Fortunately, we have enough to land, at least we probably have enough to land. We're transferring the fuel from the Kerbin return stage now to the, to the landing stage. We do have enough to land, but there's no way in hell we're ever going to uh, get off the moon and get back to Kerbin or Earth. Uh, we'll I'm dropping the scissors that I play with. I don't know why I play with scissors. Probably because I'm an adult and that's something I just can do if I feel like it. Anyway, not going back to Earth. So that opens the doors for a rescue mission. We are landing on the moon, the lunar pole. So as soon as we touch down, there should be a plethora of science points available for dear old Belgrad Kerman. I'm pretty sure his name is not Belgrad, but... I can't read it, and that's the closest I am going to get. So it's Belgrad Kerman for now. He is going to land. He's going to radio his EVA reports and, of course, his uh, crew report from the lunar surface. Get a lot of science points for the blokes back home. Look at that. That's the Earth above the horizon there. 
and then he is going to settle in for the long haul because it will be a while before he is going to get back, if ever. Now, the dilemma I have is whether or not to use and transmit the science from the materials bay and the goo canisters. I have them along. But remember, if I take them back to Earth, that's valuable. That's uh, like three, four times as valuable as if I, as when I transmit them. Transmitting, though, is a guaranteed success. I can do that now. Taking them back to Earth requires another launch. Uh, requires Belgrade to transfer the science in his pockets to the return capsule and take that back to Earth. So that's a lot more involved. But then again, the reward is larger. Anyway, for now, let's have a look at the landing. That worked out fine. It was a textbook perfect landing, just going down slowly and having the landing legs absorb the excess speed. So there we go, a crew report for some 30 science points. Transmit that home immediately. It has. There have been a few casualties again, but the nuclear technology has been proven and we have a moon landing right here. Now, of course, oh, I can see the Bard Guard. It's not Belgrade, it's Bard Guard. Bart Gart Kerman. And there we go. 200 something science points if we keep it. And less if we transmit it. Hey, did I choose to transmit it? In my memory, I can distinctly remember to keeping that, but I suppose I transmitted it because that's what the video evidence says. Um, transmitting one of the goo canister datas and then, oh, perhaps, oh, the other goo canister, I can, of course, keep that data. Oh, I'm going to transmit that as well. I don't know what's up with me, why I did that. That was a memory failure in my head. That's disconcerting. Anyway, science points for all. And here we go with Bart Gart Kerman sampling the surface. He's going to do an EVA report now. Plant a flag and take a surface sample. That's all fairly self-explanatory. The EVA report can be transmitted home. The surface sample can in fact be transmitted but is a lot more interesting to bring back. So we're going to not give up hope for Bart Guard and attempt a rescue mission. That will be next episode. As we all know though, the track record for our Kerbal astronauts so far is not very good. In fact, it is terrible. So Bart Guard's chances are, just by virtue of that, very, very low. But for now, we're ending on a positive note with science and with breakthroughs and with transmissions and lunar landings. For the first time, we did, we achieved something that is rather good, if I do, do say so myself. And now, after 18 minutes of straight talking, my voice is giving out. So let me just say, this was Lorenzo. Thanks for watching. Subscribe if you didn't yet. Thanks if you did. Leave a like, a comment, or whatnot. Have a nice day, and see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.